This is Dr. Steve. Feel inspired. This show is going to change your life. Feel connected. Feel better. Feel better is not just a slogan for this show. It's actually a challenge, a mission, and a promise from me to you to help you live a healthier life. This is Dr. Steve. Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Salvatore. Welcome to the show. Up front today, the weight of the nation. Now, this topic is so serious. It was a subject of an HBO documentary by the very same name. So when we talk about weight loss, it's often a case of cutting calories and increasing exercise. But with the obesity rates climbing, the problem may go far deeper. Could food addiction be to blame? Over the last two decades, obesity rates have dramatically increased. According to the CDC, more than one-third of U.S. adults are obese. Childhood obesity has more than tripled in the past 30 years. National ads depict the growing problem. I don't like going to school because all the other kids pick on me. Mom, why am I fat? In response, there have been controversial efforts to cut the fat. First, it was a ban on artery-clogging trans fats. Then, in some states, calories were posted on menus. Next, an assault on salt. And in the latest effort to downsize our waistlines, a proposal in New York City to outlaw the sale of supersized sweetened drinks. But are those efforts in vain if the issue isn't what or how much we eat, but why? Well, joining me now is registered dietitian Donna James and Dr. Sympathy Gupta, a psychologist who specializes in eating disorders. Ladies, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay. So, so let me ask the question, just throw it out there. I mean, do you think that addiction to food is actually playing a role in the obesity crisis? So absolutely, for many people who are suffering from obesity, their relationship with food is like an addiction. And so it makes it very difficult then to lose weight. So is it something like as strong as like drugs or alcohol? I mean, do you see that in your, your practice? Oh, I absolutely do. So sugar and carbohydrates are highly psychoactive and they actually produce serotonin and dopamine, which are the same neurotransmitters that are secreted when cocaine is used. So just think about it, like, can you have one bite of a cookie or one bite of a pizza? It's really challenging yeah, to do that. It's That's very, very hard. Itself. Okay, so, so that's it. Okay, so then is it less about what we're eating and more about why we're eating it then? Or is it a combination of both? So it's definitely a combination, but in some ways it can be really hard to address the why. For example, with the cookie or the pizza, the anticipation of the pleasure that comes from having that cookie or the pizza, the first bite, those all make you feel really good. Um, but then you're left you know, with a host of other negative emotions. All right, to me, uh, the way I remember it is the first bite's important and the last bite's important. Yes. How many you have in the middle <laughs> is always the, the one that drives you crazy. All right, but, but you know, recently there was a big ban on large sodas and things like that in New York City. Donna, do you think that this makes any sense at all to ban unhealthy foods? I mean, where does it stop? Do we ban ice cream? Do we ban donuts? And where yeah, does it you're end? absolutely right. Like, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it's really not the right roadmap. We need a much more comprehensive approach. We need to educate people, give them tools to be able to cook, and we need to get them to separate their emotions from food. Yeah, but Dr. Gupta, I mean, so many people eat because of stress. They eat because of emotions. They eat because they're anxious. How do you deal with that? Is that just our emotions gone amok or do you channel it in a different way? It's, it's really difficult to deal with. I think behavioral therapy is one good way to deal with it, um, but you do have to learn to understand that relationship between your emotions and your food and learn different ways to cope with stress, to cope with loneliness, for example, and break that habit that's been ingrained for years and years. All right, so, so what are some of the things that you do uh, for your patients who come in and they have that kind of a problem? They're, they're emotional eaters. What do you tell them to do? Well, the first thing is, is I get them to eat a really clean diet because you've got to get that biochemistry right. Otherwise, it's much more challenging to deal with the emotional side of things and then to separate those feelings from food and to not give food power so food has absolutely no power and it's only when we allow it to use it as a comfort or as pleasure or something like that you get them to step back and ask themselves why they're actually eating that particular food so, right. to, so to consciously recognize that and then you need to work on the subconscious yeah because the, the subconscious is so hard because when you eat that food that comfort food mm -hmm. it really does make you feel good and For that's a couple the period. <laughs> <laughs> you, you feel bad after but but initially and you really do feel good so do you find a lot of people you know kind of go back and forth all the time they yo-yo through this they have no control and they have control yeah it's really hard and sometimes when they're feeling upset they just they can't think of anything else besides that food in the moment to feel 
little better. Uh, yeah, I, but the thing is, you really can't beat yourself up about it. You when have to kinda, expect relapse. Yeah, as well, you should expect like it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, ladies, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate your, your insight on this very difficult issue. Well, the conversation is going to continue online, and we want to hear from you. Is food addiction to blame for America's obesity epidemic? Head on over to Facebook and tell us what you think.